1300 B.C. 1300 B.C. Where were God's people in 1300 B.C.? No? Way before Babylon. Egypt, yes. They were in Egypt. Uh, 1300 B.C., God's people, the Jews, were in Egypt. What were they doing in Egypt? They were slaves. Yeah, they were slaves of the Egyptian pharaoh. What a story, how they got there and ended up being slaves. But, um, but we know that in 1300 B.C., God wanted to get his people out of Egypt. Okay? Why did God want to get his people out of Egypt? Was it that they were oppressed and they were being abused as slaves? Well, they were being oppressed. They were being abused. God did want to get them, to have them not be slaves anymore. But that wasn't the main reason God wanted to get them out of Egypt, believe it or not. Was it that Joseph's uh, descendants needed to settle the land of Canaan because Abraham, God said to Abraham, I'm going to give this land to your descendants and then ended up just a few generations later, they end up in Egypt and they didn't actually take the land. So was it that God needed to get his people out of Egypt and back up to Canaan? Is that why God wanted to get his people away from Pharaoh? Well, that's part of it, but that wasn't the main reason uh, that God stated at the time for wanting them out of Egypt. God had, had a man named Moses and Aaron, uh, and his, his sidekick Aaron, go to Pharaoh and make a demand of Pharaoh. Do you remember what that demand was? Let my people go, but that's just part of it. And if you wanted to find the answer to this question, what book in the Bible would you look at? Exodus, because Exodus is about the exit from Egypt. Very good. The first book of the Bible is Genesis. The second book of the Bible is Exodus. And Exodus is about the exit from Egypt. Exodus 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, tells us exactly why God wanted to get his people out of Egypt. Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. They told him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Now we know that Pharaoh's response was, nope. In fact, Pharaoh mocked God. He said, I don't know who this God is that you're talking about, or this I am critter. I, I don't know who I am is. No, you cannot go. So they ask again in verse 3. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. We really know him. This is a personal God. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Or, now notice this next phrase because I'm going to come back to it. Or, or God may strike us with plagues or with the sword. So Moses and Aaron requested a long weekend, a special three-day holiday, so God's people could go into the desert and freely worship God without having the taskmasters looking over them and, and uh, all the Egyptians around. Very interesting. Moses and Aaron did not, at this point, demand freedom for God's people. They didn't say anything about moving God's people back up to the land of Canaan, Abraham's land. God directed Moses and Aaron to ask Pharaoh to let the Israelites worship him for three days. How important is it to God that his people worship? And, and what is worship, anyway? Is, is worship the, the emotional buzz that you feel when a, when a song touches your heart or, uh, or, or brings back a memory and maybe even brings tears to your eyes? Is that, is that really ultimate worship? Is worship 
Is worship a band? Is it, is it uh, celebrity artists? Did Moses want to take God's people into the desert so they could have a, a concert out there? When someone says, I really enjoyed worship at a church, what do they usually mean? Yeah, 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 they, they like the music. Uh, you probably know people who select where they're going to go to church on a given weekend uh, based on which church they think or maybe they've heard will have will give them the best music experience worship they call it that is not only very immature it's also very shallow and it is totally unbiblical god did not give us worship primarily to meet our needs. He designed it for himself. And, and using the word worship as a synonym for just music is totally unbiblical. Worship, in fact, is the full experience, it's the full range of what happens when God's people gather together. God does not invite us to worship uh, like we invite friends to a party. God requires us to worship. There's no RSVP. God requires us to worship. God prescribes penalties for not worshiping him. Pretty serious. So what did Moses and Aaron say the part that I said, don't forget. What did they say to Pharaoh? They said, if we don't worship, we could get sick or even die. Wow. Now, of course, Pharaoh finally let the people go. Uh, but, it, but it wasn't just for a long weekend. By the time the plagues had done everything that the plagues were going to do, uh, by the time that Passover plague in particular, the death angel came and killed all the firstborn sons in the Egyptian households. Pharaoh was ready to say, just go, get out of here. I'm done with you. Just, just get out, go. So Moses led the Israelites, uh, Israelites out of Egypt and they traveled uh, south down toward Mount Sinai, actually southeast, where, where Moses announced to them he said okay folks in three days we're going to worship so get ready you have three days to get ready to worship and and after three days i want you to come gather here at the foot of this mountain because we have to worship this is why god has us here exodus 19 verse 16 on the morning of the third day Thunder roared and lightning flashed, and a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a loud, long blast from the ram's horn, and all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended in the form of fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln. And the whole mountain shook violently as the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and God thundered his reply. Now that is worship. Wow. And notice it wasn't music. There was, music was part of it. There was a ram's horn. But so was teaching. And so was the word of God. And so was just being together. Same pattern all through the Bible. People gathered for worship, and it was not just music. It was for instruction. It was for giving. It was for, for teaching. It was for serving. It was for hearing God's word. It was for encouraging each other. It's all worship, and it all pleases God. Two weeks ago, we talked about the value of gathering together as God's people. Uh, COVID has made us appreciate being together like we have never appreciated before. Gathering is absolutely essential to church. 
In fact, you, you probably could say private faith, the whole idea of private faith, I, I guess it's possible, but it's very rare. It's very rare. God's normal way is for, for people to be together, for people to assemble, which is why live streaming and watching on YouTube videos is not an adequate substitute for church. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his re return is drawing near. A couple of days ago, one of the elders sent me this, this piece. I think it was posted on social media. It's from a California pastor, and it was titled, Church on the Sofa Will Never Be the Same as Church in the Sanctuary. Great title. And he wrote this, You cannot serve on your sofa. You can't have community of faith on your sofa. You can't experience the power of a room full of believers worshiping together on your sofa. And then he went on. Let me read some more. Christians are not consumers. We are contributors. We don't watch. We engage. We give. We sacrifice. We encourage. We do life together. The church needs you. You need the church. And then he said, and I totally agree, while I'm grateful for technology to keep people connected, it is not like being in the building. Church on the sofa is nice, but it will never be the same as church together in the sanctuary or in the gymnasium or outside or wherever it is. We have to be shoulder to shoulder like you are. We have to do that if we're going to relive and recapture anything of what they had at Sinai. A little later, the writer of Hebrews uh, mentions that when God's people get together, somebody else joins us. This is amazing. We are actually joined by angels when we worship and Christians from all of time. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, Hebrews 12 says, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. This is in a worship service. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven, who have now been made perfect. Worship is a really big deal to God. John Stott wrote, True worship is the highest and noblest activity of which people, by the grace of God, are capable. Englishmen, they always got to get the English right, you know. Of which people, by the grace of God, are capable. Uh, A.W. Tozer agreed. In my opinion, the great single need of the moment is that the lighthearted, superficial religionists be struck down with a vision of God high and lifted up and with his train filling the temple. The holy art of worship seems to have passed away like the Shekinah glory from the tabernacle. As a result, we are left to our own devices and forced to make up the lack of spontaneous worship by bringing in countless cheap and tawdry activities to hold the attention of the church people. Well said. We do not need laser light shows and, and fake smoke rolling across the platform in order for us to worship God. Uh, the, the glory of God and the awesome privilege that we have of, of just being together is, is more than enough. All that is introduction because there is a psalm that is called the call to worship psalm. And that's the psalm that I want you to turn to right now if you have a Bible or a device with a Bible app on it. Turn to Psalm 95. Psalm 95. Uh, it was written by David. There's no title on the psalm, but the New Testament says it was written by David. David would have written this about 1000 BC. And this psalm has been used to call God's people together to worship ever since. I'd like you to stand if you're able and let's read it, the whole thing, aloud together. Psalm 95. Here we go. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. 
The sea is his, for he has made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the God our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. In the, in the wilderness. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared in my oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. That's the end of the psalm. Thank you. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his inspired word. What you just did was worship. Speaking God's word back to him is part of worship. And what's interesting is in worship, God is big enough to receive the worship, to simultaneously receive the worship of millions of people, but he also separates it out into individual people when you worship. When you worship, you have God's total attention. If, uh, if you are granted uh, 15 minutes, let's say, in front of someone important, let's say President Biden, if, if somebody said, you got, you got 15 minutes in front of President Biden, you would think long and hard how to use that 15 minutes, which questions to ask, which things to say, uh, when you're meeting with someone who is important, you plan ahead of time. The first six verses of Psalm 95 talk about meeting with someone far more important than any human. Verse 1 says, God is the self-existent, capital L-O-R-D. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. That's the, that's the, the Yahweh. That's the name that God gave to Moses, the the God who always existed and who always will exist. Um, as a church, we sing for joy to the great I am. And uh, it says to sing for joy, and it says to shout aloud. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. When is the last time you shouted aloud? for God. Well, we're kind of inhibited, aren't we? Some, some translations say, make a joyful noise. Whether you're shouting or, or making a joyful noise, it, what I notice, it doesn't matter if you can carry a tune, because I don't know anybody that can shout on tune. I like, uh, I've been getting up at four o'clock in the morning, and uh, doing my walking miles be before the day gets heated up. It's, it's a beautiful time of day. It's actually dark when I start walking, but the eastern horizon starts getting light about uh, 4.30 or so. And uh, about 4.45, the birds start singing. I love listening to the dawn birds. You know, uh, for as common as they are, as ordinary as they are, robins just have a beautiful, beautiful song. And, and part of my walk is on Jackson Road. I like Jackson Road because there's hardly any traffic on it. But on Jackson Road, it, it's all horse uh, properties. And uh, there's several of those properties where people have roosters. And you know what roosters do as soon as it starts getting light. And so the roosters are crowing. They, roosters sing loud. They sing often. They sing to each other. One will crow and then the, these different farms are talking to each other. Um, blue jays sing loud too, don't they? And you go, oh man, I hate the sound of blue jays. How about crows? There's crows on Jackson Road too. So you, you got the roosters, you got the crows, you got the, you got the blue jays. The music that those three birds make doesn't really fit in with robin music. It, it, it's very different. But those birds are doing the very best that they know how to do to welcome the new day. They are making a joyful noise and they shout joyfully. So 
it should be when we worship. Be loud, be joyful. And if somebody doesn't, next to you doesn't like what they're hearing in their ear, that's their problem. It's their problem. Tell them that God not only likes it, but he commands you to do it. Verses three to five say to worship God because he's the boss. For the Lord, that, for the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. In ancient times, the, whenever you hear the seas, there, there, was a, there was a lot of superstition, of course, connected with the seas. And, they were mysterious and, and considered uh, deadly and, and unpredictable. Not to God. He, he owns them. He created them. They're his. Uh, verses 6 and 7 talk about body posture in worship. Eric mentioned this. Come, come let us bow down and worship. Now, this is not this. That's not what he's saying. Actually, Eric's dogs are biblical. They have it right. The, the bow down here is... All four, all four limbs out, spread eagle, you are on your face. You're on, on the ground at the top of the steps. Bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So, so David is writing this, of course, and David knows all about flocks. He knows all about shepherds. Middle Eastern shepherds, of course, uh, called their sheep they led their sheep they didn't drive their sheep the way my grandpa always did but here just hearing the shepherd's voice provided assurance to the sheep that that all was well god is good god is gracious god is powerful he is worthy he wants our worship he 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 uh, commands our worship and then in the middle of verse seven there the tone shifts from invitation to warning Look at the last half of verse 7. Today, if only you would hear his voice. God says, this is God talking. He says, he says, if only you would listen. If only you would hear my voice. If, if only you would obey. If we were to outline uh, Psalm 95, it might look like this. God's favor falls on those who worship. That's verses 1 to 6. They're, they're kind of the carrot. Verses 7 to 11 are the stick. There is a stick to it. If you neglect to worship, some bad things can happen to you. Look at verse 8. Do not harden your hearts, God says, as you did at Meribah, as you did that day in Massa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. God is displeased when his people do not worship. God had told his people to worship, and, and, and when they did, God granted guidance, he granted protection, but something went sideways at this, these two places, Meribah and Massah. The two place names mean uh, grumbling and ungrateful, grumbling and ungrateful. The people did not worship God, and God was not a happy camper. Notice the last phrase of verse 9. Your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what God did. Now, that's the indictment right there. The Israelites who left Egypt, they had seen the Passover. They had seen all the plagues. They had seen what happened when that Passover angel passed over all the Jewish homes. They had seen the, the Red Sea open up and they saw the dry grand, ground that they got to walk over. They had seen when they got across, the Egyptian army come into that same Red Sea and the waters cover up the Egyptian army. They had seen every night that pillar of fire hanging over the, the camp that was a symbol of God's presence. Says, yep, you're exactly where I want you to be right now. They had seen in the daytime this the same kind of pillar only was a cloud that, that moved with them and led them toward Sinai. They had seen that. Barely a month out of Egypt, they had seen God deliver Joe's donuts every morning just outside their, their tent, tent door, fresh every day. Donuts for breakfast and for supper, the original quail Chick-fil-A sandwich. <laughs> what? 
what a, what a diet. Talk about having it easy. And after seeing all that, that that God had done, you would think the Israelites would just want to worship God all day long. But there's something about people, us people, that no matter how much we have, and no matter how much God has done, we always can think of what we need a little more. And we can always find ways to, to complain about something. Um, here's Exodus 17, right after God started the Uber Eats deliveries. Exodus 17. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, and all the people will drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? I mean, here they were getting daily food deliveries in an empty desert, and they ask, Where is God when we need him? Last week, Matt mentioned the old hymn, Count Your Blessings. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Instead of obsessing on, on what you think you lack, just look back. Think back on all that you have. When God's people don't count their blessings, God isn't just let, let down. He isn't just disappointed. He gets indignant. Look at verse 10. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation. ESV says that, uh, says that God loathed that generation. God was utterly disgusted with them. He found them repugnant. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared in my anger, they shall never enter my Sabbath, my rest. If they weren't going to worship God in the desert, they certainly weren't going to worship him in Canaan either. And God, so, so God knew that if 40 years of providing manna and miracles in the desert weren't going to satisfy him, neither would, the, neither would the land flowing with milk and honey. I'm giving up on these people, giving up on this generation. Well, this is a rough way for a psalm to end it's not the way you expect a psalm to end. You, you really want one more verse or two more verses. You want one more sentence. But don't worry, people. God is long-suffering. God is kind. If you don't worship him, he, he will understand that, uh, you know, you've had a rough week and it's okay. Well, it turns out God does not understand. It's God's command for us to worship with other believers. And it turns out that worship benefits us in, in more ways than one. It not only elevates our spiritual lives, but it also pleases Almighty God. Eric, come on back up and we're gonna we're gonna do some music. I mean, no, we're gonna do some worship. Let me say one other thing. If if there is a uh, if there's one other lesson I think in Psalm ninety five uh, for those of us who do attend church regularly and, and worship, it, it may be to be careful that we don't mock God by going through the motions of worship. Uh, to not be like the Pharisees that Jesus called out in Matthew 15 when he said, 
These people honor me with their lips. They say worship words, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. But when we worship, when we respond right to Psalm 95's call to worship, it brings glory to God, and it's also really good for us. So let's do that, all right?